right? Let's uh, let's go to the prayer again. Uh, great. And Lord, we we come before you right now. We yes. thank you for this precious text that you've given to us, um, written by Paul, the Apostle Paul, to re reveal the heart of his ministry, exactly what he was all about in his ministry. And it wasn't about showiness. It wasn't about miracles and revelations and all kinds of stuff like that. It was about the gospel and what the gospel was. It was upside down, inside out from everything that we know. And it's about weakness. And Lord, we don't revel in weakness. We certainly mm -hmm. don't. We revel in, in uh, feeling powerful, feeling good, feeling strong, and, uh, and all of those other things that our culture celebrates. And yet Paul celebrated the stuff that was absolutely counterintuitive, a contradiction to his culture. That he was mm. And Lord, we pray that we might be able to grasp that, get a hold yeah. of that. Yes. The Holy Spirit, get that into our lives so yes. that we are the same, that we are bringing the gospel, the true gospel to our culture around us. Not in power, not in strength, not in all those other things. But Lord, that we bring the gospel authentically, genuinely, and in weakness. The way that Jesus actually lived his life and died on the cross for us. Torn mm -hmm. on the cross. That we might have life and have it upon me. Thank you for that. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor John. For starting us off in that fashion. Let's go to our first slide. It's uh, class 33. And with a little bit of luck, we'll finish 12 and we'll be on, if not this week, next week, the final chapter in this incredible epistle that Paul wrote to this church. Wow. Uh, let's go to the prayer now. And who would we like to have pray? How about Dennis? Okay, yeah. It's good to have Dennis and Don with us. Dennis, would you mind reading our prayer? Father of all, you heard us on a child of your wings, search into the depths of our hearts, remove the blindness that cannot know you, and release the fear that would hide us from your sight. We ask this through Christ the Lord. Amen. 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 Very good. Thank you, Dennis. I appreciate that very much. All right. Thought we'd leave off. I, I thought we'd start off with verse 12, which is the last verse that we had for last week as um, the introduction for, to what will follow. The only, only summary my, I want to share is simply that Paul is on the, the home stretch in this entire letter. And he's telling them that he's warning them that he's going to be coming for a, a third time. And so that's why this uh, seriousness and the, and the gravity, gravitas of everything is building here. Mm -hmm. And he's taking on here at the end, even more intensely, the charges and the accusations that they've had against him. And uh, there's... you. It initially, uh, in a superficial look at chapters 12 and 13, you'd say, this has nothing to do with us. But when you actually get in to what Paul is trying to deal with, it's a very common problem in the modern day church that he's dealing with. There is much to learn <laughs> that Paul is sharing with us. And hopefully, with the Lord's help, We'll glean some of this and uh, and try to apply it in our own lives uh, by the grace of God and through the power of the Spirit. So, with that in mind, let's have uh, uh, Dennis, if you wouldn't mind, just read it one more time. And I'm going to be asking this question. So, when you read read uh, the verse, and when Dennis reads the verse again, try to be ready with a your best answer for why Paul will talk about this particular virtue of endurance to the Corinthians. So if you could read it for us again, once it comes up. Okay. 
2 Corinthians 12, 12, the signs of a true apostle were performed among you with utmost perseverance, signs and wonders and mighty works. Okay, great. Thanks again. All right, while it's still up there, He's saying the hallmark, the really the, the, the confirmation of a legitimate apostle uh, sent one from God, a representative of God for the people on earth as a human. He gave them what they were. And notice that we have the try in in the final sentence, line four signs wonders my works or miracles okay now remember we already had that at the very beginning of chapter 12 where he's taking on what the so-called super apostles were bragging about having the signs wonders and miracles in their own ministry and they were legitimate and paul was not so here paul's going to turn the tables to some degree yeah. because he's going to show that the hallmark of any real apostle, any real minister of the gospel, would be performed not just with signs, wonders, and, and, and miracles. Fine, that might attend it. But notice what he prefaces it with, with perseverance. Now, I pulled from the NIV here. Normal, I'd say 7 out of 10. The NRSV gets the English translation right better in, in terms of the actual words than, than I think the NIV does. But here, uh, this is one of those three out of 10 where the NIV does a better job because the NRSV here has utmost patience. It's not the word patience. It's the word hupomane that we had all over the place when we studied Revelation, remember? Steadfast endurance or perseverance. So the NIV got that right. And he doesn't just say these all of this of a true apostle were performed among you with just old hupomane. He's saying with utmost perseverance, all this was accomplished. So here's the question. Why this particular virtuous quality of endurance? Why this one? And, and in abundance, he's saying, I showed you that I'm the real McCoy. They, it, the obvious implication is they are not by utmost endurance or steadfast endurance. Well, why that one? Well, he has such a history with them where he's been, he's persevered through all of their issues, whereas these super apostles necessarily have not. Good. That okay. It speaks to his heart. Okay. Right. True. Now, doesn't this speak to the grand paradox of not just of a true minister of the gospel, but of a true disciple of Christ? Doesn't this speak to that grand par what grand paradox that Paul's been saying? From, from chapter one on, what paradox? That's counter-cultural for them then and us today. What parad grand paradox of the Christian life do we want to have very little, if, if anything, to do with that Paul keeps talking about? Suffering, weakness, or yeah, he says, weakness. He says, um, I'll boast more gladly about my weakness so that Christ's power may rest on that. I mean, I think that's the paradox. The Christ's power will rest, but it's in our weakness where that happens. That's right. Exactly. Okay. Doesn't this tie in? What, what might make it a little easier for us to understand about how God's strength, his power, his manifestation of his greatness doesn't come in our glory, in our braggadocio, or any of those things. It comes out of our own frailty, our mortality. Here's, a, here's a, a, a parallel in the teaching of Jesus that makes it so much easier to understand the grand paradox. Because this, this one's another one, and we all know it well. The first will be? Last. And the last will be first. And the last will, What does that mean? What does that mean fleshed out in everyday Christian living? 
What does that mean? Like not putting ourselves first out there, but humbling ourselves to put other concerns before ours. I don't know. Yeah, you're on it. No, Deb, Deb you got it. Remember how the uh, the disciples wanted to have the best seats in the kingdom of God and all yeah, that? Yeah. And Jesus oh. said, you guys still don't get it, do you? You still don't get it. God will exalt. Uh, see, the beauty of it is we're not left last. We're exalted by the only person, only thing that really counts in our lives by God himself when we're servants, when we care about those that no one cares about, pray for those that no one's praying for, all those mundane things that we look down at as, as uh, who cares? Uh, I want to I want to show how great I am this way, that way, the other way. We show our greatness through our servanthood. And that's exactly what is going on here when Paul is still to the very end trying to help the Corinthians wrap their mind around what true Christian living and faith is all about. Utmost perseverance. Now remember, yeah, I got I got you, uh, John. Remember, they should know this. They should he shouldn't be having to tell them this. Why not? What epistle of the 13 that are attributed to Paul has in it to the congregation he wrote to, and we have the mind of Satan. Oh, no, he didn't say, he oh, didn't say that, did, did he? He didn't say that. He <laughs> said what? We have the mind of Christ. Of Christ. Do you know which church he said that to? I'm guessing, Corey. Bingo. Good guess. He <laughs> said, good guess. <laughs> yeah, he said it to the Corinthians. Did he say it in his first letter to them that we have? Or the lost one? And we have oral tradition somewhere else? Or in the second letter that we're going through ourselves? Which one? Where did he say that? Which which letter? The first, the lost one, or this one? You want another guess? I'll yeah. take the first one. You're right. Good purple. Yeah. It's, guess, right. it's guess. It's guess time. <laughs> <laughs> good good guess. Okay, Pastor Johnny. <laughs> Go ahead, John. Oh, okay. Yeah, I mean, I'm thinking. You know, you're talking about this uh, this paradox, and I go back to the first letter in Corinth. Uh, chapter four, and he, and he has this marvelous uh, little section in here. He says, um, he says, already you have become rich. You have become kings, and that without us. How I wish that you really had become kings so that we might be kings with you. For it seems to me that God has put us apostles on display at the end of the procession, like men condemned to die in the arena. We've been made a spectacle to the whole universe to angels as well as to, as to mm. men. We are fools for Christ, but you are so wise in Christ. We are weak, but you're so strong. You are honored. We are dishonored. To this very hour, we go hungry and thirsty. We're in rags. We're brutally treated. We're homeless. We work hard with our own hands. We're cursed, and yet we bless. And when we are persecuted, we endure it. When we are slandered, we answer kindly. Up to this moment, we have become the scum of the earth, the refuse of the world. I mean, I think that captures in in that in a very succinct way with Paul. I mean, and, and it's satirical <laughs> with yeah. what he's saying right. to right. Corinthians. Right. Yeah. yeah. And and in that, and all of the being the uh, off scouring of the of the world and all that, in that, uh, P, uh, look down upon, etc. It's in that that the manifestation of God's power and glory and the liberation of the Corinthians and everyone that crossed Paul's path mm -hmm. that believed the gospel was transformed from out of darkness into light. And there it is. Now, let's go back yeah, for a minute. Dr. Smith, yeah. um, Brownie has had her hand up for a while, my love. Oh, okay, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay, Brownie, chime in here. 
<laughs> Sorry to interrupt your thought, but this uh, goes way back. This goes back a little bit, but when you were talking about strength and weakness, see if I'm just, I mean, the very essence of Jesus being tortured and, and just killed on the cross just horribly mm -hmm. and ascending. I mean, talk about strength from weakness. He conquered death mm -hmm. and by being killed. And and to me, that that is when we talk about God does his best work when we're we can rely on him. Jesus may not have been relying on him totally, but I mean, the whole the whole essence of him was brought by God back up. And I just think that's like um, really indicative of what you're talking about. Right. And, and in fact, you're you're anticipating where we're going later in this chapter. He's going to get into that very thing. Well, you'll see when we get there, you'll see it. So you're you're anticipating we, where we're going to go. No, what I wanted to uh, share with you is we read these texts and, oh, that's nice. And we don't really <laughs> see, see their, their importance to us. Now, let's take that text. Now, ironically, Paul wrote, that's from Romans, okay, uh, wh when he says, we have, uh, no, sorry, that's from 1 Corinthians, we have the mind of Christ, 1 Corinthians, right. And, okay, let's start there. If they really had the mind of Christ, if they really, really did have the mindset of the risen Christ, would they have mistaken Paul's apostleship as no. uh, deceptive, duplicitous, all those things, and the super apostles? Uh, would they have gotten it as so wrong if they had the mind of Christ? No. Doesn't seem likely. Doesn't seem likely. Okay. So that brings the brings to to bear the question. Well, if they didn't have the mind of Christ, and they're missing the biggest thing ever, and that is the minister who brought them to Christ in the first place, then what it does what does it mean to have the mind of Christ? Mm -hmm. What what are they doing wrong? Okay, okay. Now I want to go to to a to a verse that helps us unpack that. Because we could be uh, guilty. In fact, if you, when we look at the church discipline and the stuff going on that continues to persist in Corinth, we've got some of that in the churches throughout the, uh, throughout the land today. And unfortunately, it, that includes the evangelical churches as well. So we, we need to pay a lot of heed here and not just say, well, co the Corinthians were a bunch of moral idiots and we're not we're above that. We're superior to that. We're, we would never fall into that that category. Well, okay, where do we go? Ironically, we'll go to the, the book that Paul wrote when he was at Corinth, the book of Romans, chapter 12. I'm going to quote the verse. You know it by heart. And it ties into the mind of Christ. And it ties into what's wrong here at Corinth in this uh, verse 12 that Paul is pointing out to them. What's that? In chapter 12, Make uh, give your uh, give your bodies as a living sacrifice to the Lord. It's a we know the passage. It's the very first verse. He comes out of the gate after nine through eleven. That whole excursus on what happens at the end, all of Israel being saved, this great great awakening, all this great stuff, and then he goes on into the whole imperative aspect, the whole command part, becoming who we are in Christ, just like he does in all his lives. First half, who we are, the indicative. The second half become who we are okay but we often detach that verse from the one that follows it can't be detached a living sacrifice is one he says and show your living sacrifice show yourself as presenting yourself to god on a daily uh, continual basis by not continuing to be conformed to this age now, some of our translate, most of our translations translate verse two as world. It the word, trust me, the word cosmos is not there. Paul does not use the word cosmos there. He uses I own. Why? Why does he? Why does he use the word age? Well, what spirit do we have when we're regenerated? The spirit of this age, or the spirit of the age to come? 
Right. And the re the other reason he's putting it that way is because remember in Galatians, he talks about the cosmos. In the very opening verses, Paul says to the Galatians, we have been set free from this present evil, not age, <laughs> world. Okay, so what? What? where's he going to go with that? So he says, on the one hand, stop being continuing to be conformed to this age. Does the, our culture include what's part of this present evil age? Yes, yes it does. That it, our culture is part of this world, not apart from the world yet to come. Don't continue to be conformed, schematized. Literally, it means the Greek word there is schema. Don't be schematized by this world, by, by this age, but be continually, it's present progressive, continually be transformed. How? He tells you how. Anybody know how? By the renewing of your mind. By the continual renewing of our mind. See, there's 24 references to the word mind in the New Testament. Paul owns almost all of them. And the one that's really interesting that he doesn't own is that the last chapter of Luke's gospel where Jesus, when he's on the road to on the road of Emmaus with the whoever the believers were in him, and he opened their mind mm -hmm. to the scriptures. Okay. That other than that, that's it. Everywhere else, all those 20 plus uses of mind, Paul owns. And why? Because Paul knew how important our thought life was for genuine Christianity. So he's telling the Roman Christians, both Jewish and Gentile, if we're going to really be who God's called us to be and transformed us into becoming, we have to continually renew our mind. That's how we get the mind of Christ. Well, how do we re renew our mind? Paul will always talk about renewal and the thought life in terms of the spirit's empowerment in it. I mean, think about it. How do we pray? We pray to Jesus. How? Through the spirit right. that he has given us. So see how we can now connect the dots with why they were pretty clueless? Their prayer life, their right. life of mind renewal was at a very low level. Mm -hmm. Is there any other conclusion that we can make there? Mm -hmm. So is there anything for us to learn from this in terms of, I mean, that's a pretty basic thing that they got wrong about Paul. They listened to these outsiders. They listened to people that were sharing with them the spirit of the age to come and those values and, and those ideals, no, they were listening and bought, drinking the Kool-Aid of their culture. And those people that came in were excellent charlatans. They knew how to say it, what to say, and how to say it. And they drank the Kool-Aid. And so much so that life in the spirit, the mind of Christ, that went to the wayside for not all of them, of course, but too, too many of them. That's a warning to us all, isn't it? Okay, Pastor John. Yeah, in, in Titus, um, it's interesting. He said, you know, he says, to the pure, all things are pure, but to those who are corrupted and do not believe, nothing is pure. In fact, he says, he uses this word, both their minds and consciences are corrupted. They claim to know God, but by their actions, they deny him. You know, that's, again, there, there's another um, review, so to speak. Of, yeah. of people whose minds are not on Christ or in Christ. Right. And what, I mean, well, mm -hmm. what comes to my mind is mm -hmm. there's a lot of flavors of Kool-Aid out there, too. <laughs> <laughs> You're right, John. Yeah. That's a great yeah. comment. Wow. Satan yeah. just keeps mixing up batches. So. Yeah, that's true. Uh, it's a variation on a theme of Kool-Aid. <laughs> but it's all, it's all this, it's really at, at core, uh, this age Kool-Aid. Different yeah. colors, different flavors. 
but it's all the same. Please. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I, I think I think in this where we're at now, listening to TV, listening to the news, or even listening what goes on in the church, unless we are able to by ourselves practice praying about things, practice when something comes into you from the TV set, practice praying that God shows you, is this truth or isn't it truth? Let me accidentally bump into the exact opposite news, Lord, if you want me to further consider what's going on. I like in our church the fact that pastor not only prays here, but he encourages us to pray by ourselves, you know. I think it's so important that so many churches don't encourage people to do their daily devotions. Mm -hmm. They don't encourage people to get by themselves. So they have a mob set. They have a mob mentality when they pray in the church. But if you're not praying by yourself, you're not going to get individual words from the Lord. I think that that's what he was talking about, too. Yeah, right. And you're bringing up, a, 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 I think, a really great point that's worth fleshing out for a second. Oftentimes people and on on everything, but we're we're talking about spiritual truths here. So let's keep it uh, okay. with uh, Christian stuff. People often confuse two words, ideals and values. Everyone idealizes a prayer life and idea uh, and thinks it's a great uh, desire and a, and a wonderful thing to aspire to, to be uh, like uh, Purple was just saying having a life, nothing glamorous about it, but just every day having a prayer, prayer life, a structured prayer life that we commit to. Why do we need that? Well, the what we're seeing here about the thought life, remember what Paul told the Philippians who were going through a lot of uh, struggle. He's in prison trying to encourage them. He's about to be killed and he's doing his utmost to encourage them. Remember how he said what he went right at, it's why he was so successful on, under everything that he went through. Remember how he said, imitate me as I imitate Christ? Who do you know that you that can say that? I can't. I, I, I don't know anybody. I mean, we all try. It's not like we're not Christians and everything. But this guy really <clears throat> had success, <clears throat> excuse me, in his prayer life. How do I know that? Because of his thought life. He tells them in, at, in Philippi, whatever things are good, noble, virtuous, the good things that God gives us, think on these things. Yes. Yes. Think, see, how do we get there? We love to go on the negative. We love to talk about the bad stuff and dwell on that, etc. It's For whatever reason, it's kind of satisfying to do that and vent and so on. And, and we're going to vent. It's nothing... I don't see uh, any great sin in inventing per se, but he's saying, put the focus where it matters on the Lord and what, what he's doing, the blessings that he does that overcomes all these things, that overcomes it. And so what, what about this ideal and value? What we value, we do. What we idolize, we wish for, we hope for, we talk about it, we do all those things in a given week. And this is, I'm saying this to encourage myself as well. Do I value renewing my mind, having the mind of Christ, and having the, a healthy, vibrant thought life? Because it starts with our thought life, doesn't it? It starts there. And for me, it does. And if I value it, I'm going to do it. If I don't value it, I'll replace that with other stuff. Mm -hmm. It's that simple. Okay, Pastor John. Yeah, I'm, I, I, I couldn't help but think, you know, we are talking about prayer and ex schemes, you know, where Paul says in Ephesians, he says, um, you know, put on the full armor of God so you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. And he goes through the, the armor of God, which uh, we know about. But uh, he ends by saying, and pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and keep on praying for all the saints. Pray also for me that whenever I open my mouth, 
Words may be given me so I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. I mean, pray in the spirit. You know, yeah. I mean, because you, because what we're at war against is the devil's schemes. He's talking, right. to, Christian, he's talking to Christians here. You know? Also, the last thing that you said there, I believe, is why we pray for you right before you start the sermon. Yeah. Um, you know, right there it says, pray for Read the last, very last. He says, uh, "Pray." He says, "Pray that I may declare it fearlessly." Yes. Gospel, so that's why we pray for Pastor right before he starts right. to speak. Right. Really great passage to bring up, uh, to tie in, and our challenge isn't just Satan. Our challenge is we're going to see in the verses that follow mm -hmm. that uh, the Corinthians yielded to were the works of the flesh. Right. See, right. we become. See, it begins with divine grace, but it doesn't end. It doesn't end after at, at the very transformation at the beginning. It's to be God. We have to immerse ourselves in God's grace mm -hmm. so that we have the fruit of the spirit to overcome the works of the flesh, which is more powerful. If you're a, if you're regenerate, the fruit of the spirit is more powerful than works of the flesh. But. Mm -hmm. It doesn't happen automatically. We all, everyone know, uh, you can be a Christian one week and you realize that. My first, my first week as a born again believer, I didn't never had so much str struggle and, and temptation and tests, but the Lord helped me overcome them. Why? Because love is stronger than hate. <laughs> I'll, I'll write down the list. Joy is stronger than, than sadness, et cetera. Etc. So it it yeah we're up against Satan, but we're also up against the flesh. But thanks be to God, God's spirit is more powerful. God is more powerful than even our flesh. Amen. That's the view. That's why uh, he who has life. Remember in John's Gospel, he who has life, resurrection life, has life indeed. We a person never has real life until they come into the kingdom of God. Amen. 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 Okay. Uh, if there's, this is great conversation. We're not making a lot of verse progress, but we're having a, a good time with, with fleshing this out. Okay. Verse 13, new ground. How about uh, purple? Okay. Let's have purple, which is a very lovely color. And it was a wonderful novel as well. Second Corinthians 12, 13. How have you been worse off than the other churches, except that I myself did not burden you? Forgive me this wrong and forgive me this wrong injustice. Amen. Yeah, great, great uh reading there, purple. Thank you for that. <laughs> okay. Now he's he's kind of turning the tables on them because all along um it's been he's been kind of in the position of, of the accused. Now he's turning it on them. He's holding them accountable for their accusations, the innuendo, the buying into what these false apostles uh, were, were uh, telling them and throwing shade on Paul. So here he's going to take on that whole issue of client patron where he would, they would pay him for his services and he would be minister and do the service uh, for the, the patron, okay? But he didn't want to do, he never would do that with them. He'll say it again. He'll never do that with them. Not that he didn't love them, but because he didn't want to be compromised in that relationship with them that he knew that could possibly happen with them. So here he's calling them out on, uh, let's see, verse 13. Have you been worse off than the others, except that I myself did not burden you? Now, the word burden, remember, it was in all caps. Remember, we saw Paul use this earlier. You may not remember it. See the a third line there, except that I myself didn't burden you. Well, they wanted that burden because mm -hmm. the word there, Paul's already used before. For it's a semi-technical term for the patron-client relationship. He's saying, I did not want to get into that with you. And have you be having to pay me? 
So here, see the sarcasm? Now, why did I cross out the, the word wrong there? Notice up at the top next to the, uh, the verse, NRSV slash literal, right there, we're, I'm going right to the literal Greek word there for forgive me, and it isn't the word wrong. I don't know what the NIV puts there, but it isn't, uh, if it is anything other than injustice, it, it's not uh, exactly the word that Paul used. The closest English translation to the Greek word there is forgive me this injustice. Now, why did I bother to do that? Wrong and injustice, they're kind of close. Well, which one is more intensive in its sarcasm? Mm -hmm. Injustice. injustice, yeah. Exactly. Uh, so he's letting them have it. He's he's fed up with this whole argument about you don't trust us. Uh, why can't you you do this with the other churches? You think uh, us as as inferior, and then to to make it even worse in the verses that follow, that uh, the implication is well you're you're going to double dip in a different way. You're not getting money out of us that way. The the obvious way. Uh, you're going through this this so-called collection for the church in Jerusalem and using your own uh, minions to get the money that way. So Paul's calling him out. He here at the end of the letter, he's calling him out on all of this stuff and asking them, okay, you think that way? In what way did I, in any way, defraud you? And let's move to verse uh, 14 if we if there's no comments or questions where it, it will only develop further. Uh, and about Debbie. Okay, Debbie, 14. Second Corinthians 12, 14. Look, I am ready to come to you this third time, and I will not be a burden because I do not want what is yours, but you. For children ought not to lay up for their parents, but parents for their children. Excellent. Thank you, Debbie. Let's read, let's keep that up for a minute. The reason I struck out here, because that's in the NRSV, but it's very, very bold. This is this is a command. He's saying, hey, pay attention. Uh, look, I'm ready to, well, look, be pay attention to what? I am ready to come to you this third time. Mm. What do you think that meant? Given the context of uh, where everything's been up in, up till this up to this verse, is that uh, is that an exciting thing for them? Are they eager for that, <laughs> or is there a little bit of latent uh, warning and uh, solemnness to this? I am. Uh, Pay attention. I'm ready to come to you this third time. Oh, they're, they're, uh, yeah, he's wanting to let them know I'm not taking any guff anymore and I will not be a burden. Why? He explains why in, in uh, line three and following. I don't want to be a burden because I don't want what's yours. I don't want your money. <laughs> I don't want your money. I want you. And notice the analogy he uses. Now, that analogy uh, continues to our own day. The children, we're not talking about adult children that won't leave the house and they're in their 20s or 30s. I'm, we're not talking about that. <laughs> we're talking, <laughs> uh, to, to be somewhat fair, I mean, the prices of housing in, this, in the Bay Area, oh my goodness. I mean, <laughs> it's ridiculous. But anyway. No, he's talking about uh, the the children, their their my their minors that are under their care. Even then, it was the duty of the parents and the nuclear family to take care of and and get established yeah. in all those ways, including financially, for their own children. And here, Paul is using that same metaphor he's already used about the family. He's uh, back in First Corinthians. Remember, you have a thousand teachers or or instructors or what have you but you only have one spiritual father mm -hmm. and that would be me and here he's again showing despite what they do have the mud and the slander and the false accusation after one after one after another despite all that look at the love of this guy for them 
what a what a great test of authentic ministry or discipleship is to love despite that yeah absolutely. they're his children he loves them he they are dear to him as when they go we're going to see later the lord is going may have to humiliate paul in their midst in that third visit and we'll we'll, we'll unpack that what it means there but he's leading up to that through this verse about how much they're endeared to his heart and to his soul and every fiber of his being. Mm -hmm. He loves these people. Sure, they're the blessed mess, but they're still blessed. Mm -hmm. That's the beauty of it. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Any comments or questions before we go forward in this wonderful epistle? All right. About Don? Okay, Don, for verse 15, if you would. Once it comes. Second Corinthians 12, 15. I will most gladly spend and be spent on behalf of your souls. If I love you more, am I to be loved less? <laughs> okay, the so sarcasm is reigning supreme again. The underlined words and the striked out word. The striked out word for you, I'm will be, I will most gladly. So he doesn't just say I will. Uh, spend and be spent for you. If I love you more, am I to be loved less? No. He pours it on. I will most gladly spend and be spent, not for you. That's our translation. Literally, the Greek is saying there, on behalf of your souls, on behalf of the, the core of who you are, the seed of your understanding and being. Mm -hmm. I'll be I'll spend and be spent. Now, verse 15 is a wonderful example of how Paul enjoys throughout his, his epistles. There's not a single epistle that he doesn't give in to the enjoyment of pairing words where the one, first one is the same as the second one, but the second one is an intensification in meaning of the first. Mm -hmm. And that's what he's doing here. I will most gladly spend, kind of like spending money at the Dollar Tree store, you know, us big spenders and all, and but and be spent. And there he's talking about it, about spending, being spent to the point of utter and total exhaustion. He'll gladly do it for their eternal souls. Wow! Again, he's showing his incredible agape for these people and. And then he goes into the sarcasm mode. Okay, if I'm pouring out all my all this love as a father for his children and not sparing one nickel or one one effort in any way, shape, or form, is is it too much to ask that you love me back in return? <laughs> wow. So he's carefully using these these words here and this sarcasm to drive home his point. What's the point? See that my, the, the heart wrenching logic mm -hmm. of Paul's plea here, mm -hmm. the heart wrenching logic of it, Paul's love for the Corinthians exceeds that of even a parent for their own children. So, is it too much to ask for them to love him at least like a child of its parent? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He's sharing here by getting into all of this with them. Paul is showing his scars of love that he bleeds for uh, his uh, Corinthian congregation. Uh, do you think the uh, imposters were doing any of that? No. Oh, they were bleeding. Oh, yeah, they were bleeding. They were bleeding them dry. They were doing that. <laughs> uh, and Paul would say, uh, forgive me that injustice. <laughs> okay. Oh, comments or questions? We can move into 16. I love 16. 16 is great. Yeah, it is. Okay. Um, How about Brownie? Okay. Brownie? Uh-oh. What happened? Second, what? 
Okay, go ahead. Second Corinthians twelve sixteen it says false accusation. <laughs> Let it be assumed that I did not burden you. Nevertheless, you say, since I was crafty, I took you in by deceit. Amen. Excellent reading. Good job there, Brownie. Okay, while it's still up, this is how far the Corinthians, not, again, not all of them, but way too many of them, how, how far they stooped to even giving in to the idea that, okay, I didn't get my money through the patron-client relationship, but I got it through these other means. He's calling them on it here because they've turned a blind eye not to one or two, but all the many ways that Paul was above board with money with them. Let's go back for a second to for, uh, the last chapter of 1 Corinthians, chapter 16. He had the, told them at the outset, go ahead, have this all this stuff sorted out, collected, and send it before I come. So how can they call charge him with that? Remember, he appointed, on top of that, he appointed two of their own people to accompany the collection. Mm -hmm. How could he get make his inroads or have his minions make inroads on that? They couldn't. And then he sends Titus to get the whole thing finished and, and get the job going again before Paul was anywhere near it. And they loved Titus. They knew he was an upfront, uh, totally um, trust a trustworthy character. So there was nothing in any way, shape, or form. Paul went to great lengths to separate himself between him and the money and the Corinthians. And they knew that. And he's having to, to uh, call them on it here. But it doesn't end in verse 16. Uh, Pastor Joe. Yeah, I, I, I just quick comment. I like the way the NIV puts it. I mean, it really hammers home uh, the sarcasm. He says, yet crafty fellow that I am, I caught you by trickery. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Crafty fellow that I am. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's good. That is good. Yeah. Okay. Right. That's the kind of person I am. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Verse 17. How about Betty? Okay. Betty, would you join the circus of joy? Well... Second Corinthians twelve seventeen. The little sign says, "Taking candy from a baby." <laughs> <laughs> Did I take advantage of you th through any of those whom I sent to you? Excellent. That those two words. Well, the verb "take advantage." Did I take advantage? See. 17 is actually making explicit what the that really great I agree that translation of verse 16 there uh was was saying and what how is that well our English kind of uh dilutes a little bit that this is again another one of those uh semi-technical terms it meant taking advantage of someone specifically by trying to cheat them out of money mm -hmm. he literally is saying saying that right here in 17 it's it's strongly implied in 16 in in the niv but here he's calling them out on you said i've done that you know i haven't now in 18 he's going to double down even further and, and bring it kind of bring it all back bring it all home uh, verse 18 uh, Pastor Jonathan. Okay, Pastor Jonathan. By right, 2 Corinthians 12, 18, I urged Titus to go and sent the brother with him. Titus did not take advantage of me, did he? Did we not conduct ourselves with the same spirit? Did we not take the same steps? Yeah, rhetorical questions, all, all three of them. Mm -hmm. Uh, and th the way the Greek is written, it, it, it expects you to answer, yes, we did, did, we did take the right steps. We did conduct ourselves with the same spirit. Uh, we did not, Titus did not take advantage of you, did he? They know all three of those rhetorical questions 
they would be silent when this would be read in the house churches throughout Corinth. I guarantee you, you wouldn't hear, you'd be able to hear a pin drop because he's calling them out for slandering him unfairly. Now, why do I have the word spirit there underlined? The NIV is, is distinctive being the only translation, I looked up a dozen of them, that puts that in the uppercase that he's talking about the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Now, I know where that goes, uh, goes uh, where the source of that is. And by the way, that's only the latest version of the NIV. If you go back to the one, uh, the one before that and all the ones prior to it, it follows all the other translations in, in that uh, being the um, uh, lowercase, meaning same spirit, same uh, principle, that kind of thing. Okay. Why, why, did, why is it uh, the consensus right and uh, the latest version in IV wrong? Well, where, where does that come from? I looked up in uh, God's Empowering Presence uh, Gordon Fee, the great eminent New Testament scholar, uh, pneuma, pneumatologist, I mean, he really knows um, all this stuff. He spent about six pages in that book on this verse, mm -hmm. telling us why it should be capital S, okay? And he conceded that, yes, there's problems with it, et cetera, et cetera. So he, he was fair, and he always is. And but he he really wanted to go there. And the only reason after I read that very carefully, but trying to be open minded. It kind of comes down to this. When you're writing a book. About a particular topic. You're going to be looking for that everywhere, <laughs> aren't you? It's a book about the Holy Spirit throughout Paul. And so he's going to see, it's human nature to see that kind of thing. And the very fact that the New, New American Standard Version, that is the most, if you want a literal translation, that's your, that's your one. Starting with the authorized uh, Standard Version, ASV, way back in 1909, followed up by the one in 1995, followed up by the one in 2020. Not, and they're as literal as you're going to ever get. And even they have this lowercase s spirit. Now, is it a big deal? Not, not really, but what he's trying to get at there in that verse is, did we comport ourselves with the kind of character or principles that we're being accused of? Any of us, mm -hmm. uh, my, my uh, brothers in Christ, me, myself, they, they knew what he was talking about that it wasn't true. He always conducted himself, comported himself above board in every every way. And they knew that. And that's what that's what he's trying to get to, culminating with calling them out with those rhetorical questions. Mm -hmm. Okay. So if there's no comments or questions on that, we can now move to a more positive verse where he comes back around and tries to share with them uh, what his his real intentions have been all along that they should have known, but he's got to remind them of them. Verse 19. About Dennis. Okay, Dennis again, if you would. Second Corinthians 12, 19. Have you been thinking all along that we have been defending ourselves before you? We are speaking in Christ before God. Everything we do, beloved, is for the sake of building you up. Excellent. Great reading, Dennis. Okay, let's take that first, another rhetorical question. Have you been thinking all this time that we are trying to defend ourselves before you? Now, let's take a moment, pause for a moment, and, and try to figure out why Paul is asking that question. What does it imply? Obviously, he's trying to say, say by that rhetorical question, I haven't been. Even before we get to the explicit, I haven't been what, it, what that consists of. Before we even get to the, the, the content of why he hasn't been, why do you think he brings it up in the first place? 
Well, it's probably prevailing thought, maybe. Okay. Yes. It, okay. You're right, Deb. You're right. It would have been the prevailing thought. And as he's writing this letter to them, and remember the hardship list that he trots out to not to disprove, like the super apostles were saying, disprove his uh, uh, legitimacy as an apostle of the risen Christ, but to prove them. Okay. So you would you would get from those hardship lists and at different po po parts in the letter, you might get the idea that he is defending his apostleship. That's his his primary goal in doing it. So here he's saying, you're saying, you, you think that this whole letter is about that? What does that imply? If he's defending himself and saying, no, I'm not a fraud, et cetera, et cetera. What does that imply? The super apostles must super apostle apostles must have been uh, convincing the people that he was uh, before uh, defrauding him or, or leading him astray or something that he's uh, not uh, having them as uh, their best interest at heart. Good. Okay. Maybe there's an uh, assumption then that he's standing there, you might say, as, you know, to be defended or not on his own. And his big emphasis is it's not me, but Christ. And so right. maybe, maybe he's going to build on to that. Like it's, okay. Uh, that you're, oh, you're, and you're, I you're, wondered if he was hearkening back to a time before Super Apostle got a hold of him where they took his, him to be truthful. And I mm -hmm. don't know if yeah. he is at all saying, remember back when. That could be a part of it, too. That's a really good point about how before they came in, there was a very different dynamic. As we see at the end of this chapter, the verses that fall, and especially in chapter 13, when if you think to the chapter 12 has been heavy, solemn, mm -hmm. and all of that with a lot of gravitas, uh, 13th lays it on. I mean, it's the most sobering passage in all of this letter uh, where, and th there are different groups and there were different dynamics going on before. And it all, it was fuel, I mean, gasoline on the fire. And not only the fire that was there in, in terms of, of, of the dysfunction, but more fires with them coming in. So, yeah, let's get back to, you think all along I, I'm trying to defend myself to you. That would imply that he needed to, okay? Mm -hmm. Wouldn't it? It would imply, well, I, I need to explain myself to you. Yeah, Paul, didn't, Paul didn't have to explain himself to them. Mm -hmm. God, God was his witness. God, God is the one that vindicated... They were proof. Remember in the early chapters, he said, mm -hmm. you are letters on our hearts that the whole world is seeing mm -hmm. of my ministry. Yeah. Where were these clouds when you came into the kingdom of God? He doesn't have to defend that. It's obvious that his ministry is confirmed by and validated by changed, transformed lives. That's the big difference between a person like Paul, humbly being a minister of the gospel and the health and wealth gospel people. Mm -hmm. Big difference in the results. Uh, somebody had a comment or? No, I think that was an accidental thing. Okay, great. So let's go back to that verse, if we may, and um, reread it and see what he says explicitly why he's not defending himself. Uh, uh, Dennis, could you read it again? Yeah. Um, Second Corinthians 12, 19. Have you been thinking all along that we have been defending ourselves before you? We are speaking in Christ before God. Everything we do, beloved, is for the sake of building you up. Amen. Everything Paul has done at Corinth has been following the will and the plan of the Lord and the gospel.
that he had been entrusted with. All remember all of this stuff with the fool, uh, the fool's discourse, etc., and boasting. He said, "Yes, I will play along with it, only so far as to show you how ridiculous it is." He wasn't going for playing along with it to say, see, I'm better than them, et cetera. No, he was playing along with it ultimately to show them it's a sham. Our boasting can only be in one place, in our God, mm -hmm. who transformed. We are nothing. Remember how he quickly right after all that said, I am nothing. Well, in context of being a born again believer that's been uh, filled with the spirit of the living God, all the good that I do is because of the risen Christ, not me, myself, individually or on my own, as you've been, to, as these people have been getting, trying to get you to drink that Kool-Aid that your culture is, is, has been imbibing for many decades. So it all goes back to where Paul's heart and his ministry always has been with the signs, wonders, and and miracles, sacrificial servanthood. See, this is Paul's favorite word. See the, the ca all caps there for building? Building you up. This is his favorite word in all of his letters for the church's growth spiritually and, in, and spiritual maturity. And this is what ultimately distinguishes Paul from his rivals, that they know and knew that Paul was not trying to sell himself so that he could get money or advance his own brand and all those kinds of things. From day one, he had been a servant, like the risen, like the, the, the man of sorrows and uh, Jesus of Nazareth in his ministry, where he said, I didn't come to be ministered to but to minister, to serve, and to bring life to those in darkness. Paul's following him. Mm -hmm. And his total goal from day one all the way through has been to bleed with the blood of the risen Christ who loved him and redeemed him and brought him to a place of heartfelt love for others as he's shown it demonstrably for the blessed mess in Corinth. Amen. Wow. Okay. Uh, no comments or questions. We can move to uh, verse 20. We might be able to finish uh, the chapter today, maybe. Verse what 20. about purple? Okay. Yeah. Purple? Please. Second Corinthians 12, 20. For I fear that when I come, I may find you not as I wish, and that you may find me not as you wish. I fear... <laughs> I fear that there may perhaps be morally jealousy, anger, selfishness, slander, gossip, conceit, and disorder. <laughs> Thanksgiving. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, while it's still considering I'm eating with you, what do you mean? Now notice Thanksgiving card. I love it. <laughs> Okay, so here he has a fear. He's got another fear. But here's the first fear. For I fear that when I come, not only will he with, may not find you not as he wishes. Now, notice how he turns the tables again. And that you may find me not as you wish me to be. Yeah. What do you think, what do you think he means by that? You're not going to walk all over me. Yeah. yeah exactly. Exactly. Now, neither group is, is going to be, you know, seen right. as... Right. And that's why he said, pay it. That's why earlier, remember the verse, pay attention. I'm coming to you. I'm ready to come to you a third time. All right, let's look at for, uh, line four. I fear that there may, he spells out this fear uh, at here and he'll, he'll uh, develop it more in the next uh, final verse of the chapter. I fear that there may perhaps be quarreling. Jealousy, anger, selfishness, slander, gossip. Okay, all of that, right? Now, why do we have, all caps, just that first negative, that first vice, quarreling. Well, it's the word for rivalry. It's the word for rivalry. And guess what? This is the first 
this quarreling is the first of four words, jealousy, anger, and selfishness, that are the works of the flesh in the same order as Paul lists them in Galatians 5. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. Now, let's, let's take a moment to look at that, drill down a little bit on that word quarreling, rivalry, etc. From the very first letter that he sent to them after he left Corinth, after his 18-month ministry, a pastoral ministry to them, one of the biggest challenges they had way back then, five years ago at least, was fighting over pride of place mm -hmm. in the community. Right. Now, all eight terms Paul uses here are symptomatic of a breakdown of trust and mutual support in the believing community. See, fierce competitiveness, this rivalry stuff, this faction, the factions, the infighting, all of this was, I, Paul identified it early on in his first letter to them years ago. Just read chapter one and chapter three of 1 Corinthians. It's the exact same problems Paul's having to deal with them back then. He's continued back then in about 54 AD. He's having to deal with them now. Now, let's take a moment about the works of the flesh from this list that he gave to the Galatians by who also had interlopers coming in that didn't make life easy for, for, for the, his converts in Galatia, in the Galatian province. Just like Paul's list in Galatians 5 about the fruit of the spirit, the list he gives there about the deeds that spring from our carnal nature are not exhaustive either. Mm -hmm. See, that list of virtues of the fruit and the works of the flesh, those are not exhaustive. They are, are not a self-contained, okay, if I stay away from these, I don't have any other works of the flesh. He didn't list them all He either. Other, other positives that God go does in our lives through his spirit, it's not limited to joy, uh, joy, uh, love, and all of that. There's others as well. Anything that's virtuous comes from God, okay? Well, mm -hmm. the same is true about, about the flesh. When, when we give in to the flesh, all kinds of bad things come, come from it. So what's going on here? Pretty much all of the vices Paul lists here, he could ca categorize. What, what, where I'm going with this is all of them, not just the first four that tie in explicitly to Galatians 5, all of them could uh, be considered works of the flesh. So mm -hmm. what is the wit litmus test of where some of them actually were, were here? This is it. No wonder early on in the next chapter, Paul, Paul is finally going to have to urge them to examine themselves as to whether some of them are really living in the faith yeah. they, pro they profess to believe. Okay, now let's get to verse 21, because I'd like to, at least in a very cursory fashion, cover it, and maybe we'll pick it up and uh, finish it off next time and get into 13. So let's go to verse 21. And uh, who uh, How like? about Debbie? Okay, Debbie, yeah. What? Okay. Oh, 2 Corinthians 12, 21. I fear that when I come again, my God may humble me before you, and that I may have to mourn over many who previously sinned and have not repented of the impurity, sexual immorality, and licentiousness that they have practiced. Mm -hmm. Great reading, and you got some tough words uh, pronounced perfectly. Good job. <laughs> okay. Well, while that's still up, uh, yep, the three of the vices listed here are also found in, in that list of works of the flesh in Galatians 5. Now, in this final verse of this chapter, Paul voices yet another huge concern that he has with his spiritual children in the Lord. The, the, these are some gross sins that uh, he's using the perfect tense to describe. There are they, in other words, they've been ongoing for a very long time. And yet 
no one has been doing anything about it. He will be humbled when he is there, probably. He, he fears it uh, because of their decadence, decadence and uh, ashamed and disgraced for them. He fears, Paul fears, he'll be forced to use his apostolic authority to enforce discipline, perhaps even censoring some of these people. Remember, he had to do that in 1 Corinthians with a guy that was yes. se sexually uh, deviant and all that. So he he is concerned that he might have to excise this cancer among the redeemed. Mm -hmm. Now, punishment won't be spared, as he did in his previous visit, as mentioned back in chapter one of this of this letter. He said, "I spared you. I, I left, and I didn't get into disciplinary stuff, etc." Well, are you ready for what Paul told them back in First Corinthians? Uh, let's go to that slide. It's just one verse in chapter four. And um, perhaps Don can read it. Okay, Don. First Corinthians 4.21. What would you prefer? Am I to come to you with a stick or with love in the spirit of gentleness? Amen. So <laughs> doesn't this sound like exactly what we have in the last verse of chapter 12? So isn't it about church discipline? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, in our day, what's that? There's basically no idea. Of, there's very, very little church discipline in the church today. Why is that? Well, think about it. In our day, we have the luxury, if we're being disciplined in one church, unlike Corinth, mm -hmm. we could just go to another church a mile or two away. Right. And mm -hmm. if those people don't like our, our, quote, Christianity, our version of it, our aberrant deviant version of it, what stops them from going to another church? Mm -hmm. Corinth true. couldn't. The Corinthian churches couldn't do that. They didn't have the luxury of other churches to go to uh, without without having to be accountable for their actions. What this does is it it places something of an x-ray on how we need to work together and like Paul as a pastor, really be a, as close to knit a group of the body of Christ as my notice how all of those in oh, those two or three last verses, every single one of those vices was symptomatic of breakdown in community, healthy community life. And every one of them had to do with that. And it has to be, if it's gonna be corrected, it has to be addressed. Yeah. Right? Right. And this, yes. go ahead. Um, I'm having a little bit of a problem here because what I, I've got the four translations in front of me. And what, he's, what he says here is, I'm fearful that when I come again, my God may humiliate me and humble me in your regard. And so, and then it says, I'm afraid that when I come, my God will humble me a couple of times. So what I read is like, he, he seemed like he was kind of mad in the fact that he was like, um, um, what's the word I'm looking for when he changed like he's saying it to him smarty pants like like oh so you think I'm so you think I'm cheating you huh you know what's that called yes yeah, so, yeah when, he's saying it, when he's saying sarcastically mm -hmm. he's saying it sarcastically throughout throughout the chapter because he's upset with them because that's not nice to constantly be bickering at him and saying those things that it sounds like he's really mad at him but then the last verse to me, when it mm -hmm. says, I'm afraid that I went, that when I come to you, God may humble me. Like, I'd really like to give you both fists because you've been acting so silly. Mm -hmm. But God may tell me that I need to be a little bit more gentle with you. How do I get how do I get that out of my mind? Because what I clearly see is it says, that my God may humble me when I come to you. 
Okay. Well, I mean, I it, that I don't know if that that is if it's if it's if it's is meaning. I I really think it's at cross purposes. Primary, if it's this primary, if you're saying that that's really on the face of it, what he's saying, it it works at cross purposes with what we're going to see in chapter 13 and right. and what, what what it what he's been uh, moving toward and been reluctant to do all along and that is to discipline and be punitive with them and the humility part comes from he doesn't want to see he's embarrassed for them yeah he's ashamed for them he he's disgraced for the fact that he's got a he's going to be humbled in the sin that he's got to deal with. He's humbled before his Lord to have to uh, be uh, between them and 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 the, the Father. We're going to go to a verse next week when okay. we get to 13. Let's hold that thought. It, it, it's, okay. it's a great uh, point of conversation to flesh this out more. The verses that follow in 13 will help us a lot with that. Uh, Pastor John. Yeah, um, I'm just, uh, let's, I just want to close kind of, um, he says, my God will humble me before you. And in the NIV, it says, I'll be grieved over many of you who have sinned earlier and not repented. You know, I mean, that that humiliation, quote unquote humiliation, that hum, humbling by God is the grief that he's going to feel um, over the many that have sinned, that have just haven't repented. But right. This right. version is humble me before you and that I may have to mourn the yeah. grief. The, the voice yes. right. Hello. Uh, uh, Brownie, yeah. Me? Okay, I'm going to, I'm sorry, I'm not feeling very well, so I don't have you on video, but um, I'm going to show you just how really ignorant I am. Uh, in in the time that we're talking about, there were Jews and there were Gentiles, is that it? And were the, did the Gentiles encompass everybody who wasn't a Jew? Hmm. Well, most of the church, uh, are we talking about Corinth? Wherever. Just in general things, I think. Paul's reaching out. Yeah. Yeah. It just seems like I only hear about Jews and Gentiles. Okay. Maybe maybe flesh out the point of your yeah, question, Ronnie. Right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. The, re the reason I asked that is because you're talking about the fact that they couldn't go to another church. So I just wondered if there was the Jewish church and uh -huh. then th there was no place else for them to go. Pagans. Because... There wasn't anything else. So that's, I guess that's, I was just wondering where else, because, you know, we, we kind of have that pro here in Wickham people church hop all the time. You know, you'll find a group come here and the group in here will go someplace else and that group will go to the first church. And then the next thing you know, we're hopping again. And so it's real flexible. It's real fluid here in Wickham People change all the time. And I guess it just depends on if you like whoever's there, not the message necessarily, but whoever's there, which I was right. just wondering about the fact that there would be no place else when you said there would be no place else for them to go in Corinth, they were Jewish or they, there was no other choice. Well, yeah. Remember, remember Acts uh, spells it out pretty clearly. When Paul first came to Corinth, he went to the synagogue. There was uh -huh. a synagogue in, in Corinth. He went there and he preached the gospel and he was so successful with it that it, as typical uh, that they threw him out, and he went to <laughs> Paul of Tyrannus for a, about a year and a half and lectured there right next to the synagogue, and then the leader in the synagogue became a Christian, okay, but he didn't, he didn't go back, very unlikely for him to go back and worship in the synagogue, he, he would have come out and been a part of the people of God, so there would be Jews that became Christians, they would be in the distinct minority in a place like Corinth, uh, they would still be there. Remember uh, Priscilla and Aquila? Uh, they were in Corinth for, for a period of time, but they would be in the distinct minority. And if you were a Christian, you would not, at that after that watershed moment, you would not be welcome in the Jewish synagogue or synagogues in, in Corinth. So where would they go? Where, where would a Jewish Christian See, this whole thing is about discipline, church discipline. You're you're destroying the church. A person is in the church wreaking all kinds of havoc and causing all kinds of factions in the church. That's what the Corinthians were doing. Well, unlike today, 
where would they go if if the church leaders were doing their job? They weren't doing their job. They were letting it fester. They were letting, and this is what Paul is apprehensive about. They've let this thing fester for years. And he was trying to get, do everything in his power to spare them of it and uh, hope for the best, pray for them to come to their senses, get the mind, of, finally get the mind of Christ. Uh, enough of them to get the traction to deal with, with uh, the people that were wrecking things. And we know from, from chapters 12 and 13, that wasn't the case. He had to come and lay down, uh, lay some lumber to, to the situation. And it just wow. reminds us that in our day, we unfortunately, there is, there is a very, I don't, I never heard of church discipline pretty much ever. Uh, because you can just go wherever you want now. Yeah. So it, there's no accountability anymore. And that's that that's to our detriment. We really need yes. we need to be, as we all know, and we'll talk we can talk about this more next week. We all need to be our brother's keeper when it comes to our spiritual well-being. We need each other. The body yes. of Christ, we huh. all need to be praying for you. I mean, we're all saying it. We all need to be praying for each other. We all need to be encouraging each other. And if something isn't right, be feel free enough to share, hey, I'm struggling with X in a way that you can go to an AA meeting and do it. Mm -hmm. The church should be like that. The church yeah. should be like that. But too many aren't. Too many of them, you dress up, you look perfect, you look pretty, you say the right stuff, you act the right way, and then you leave for another week and come come back and do this, uh, the whole routine again the next week. But what what spiritual growth comes from that? <laughs> That's depressing. But adding, exactly right. adding to that, sweetheart, um, that's one of the great things about you, um, the way that you do it. Um, I remember being incredibly furious at someone. And you came to me, you listened to me, and you came to me and you said, but what is it that you believe? You need to act in alignment with what you believe. What do you believe? And I said, okay, sweetheart, right now I'm going to be angry for a while. Give me a few moments and then I'm going to return to what I believe. Just a few moments more of being angry. So, you know, when you're mentioning this, doing it in gentleness, doing this in love, right. doing it with a, with a spirit of kindness, not a spirit of accusation. And that's what you brought to me at that moment. And I'll never forget it. Oh, okay. I'm glad I could be of, of help. <laughs> okay. Any other maybe comments? Next week, maybe next week I can share. Um, I went to this conference, which was about church conflict and stuff. And maybe mm. some stuff next week. Yeah. That'd, That'd be great. great. It's, it's, That'd be great. Yeah, this is all great stuff. And uh, trust me, chapter 13 has got more of it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. Let's, should we go to prayer now? Yeah, let me stop the recording.